Yeah. Well, real quickly, he, he mentions at one point in the video that so we're, we're evolutionarily, biologically adapted to being out in the wild. And I, I, I don't think you can refute that, but I don't understand his argument in the sense that he's talking about we should go back to that, which is, I guess the argument against that is that we were already there and where we are now is the culmination of hundreds of, clearly hundreds of thousands of years of effort to control using our minds, which is our ultimate adaptive tool, the, uh, the, the most powerful biological adaption given to us and what sets us apart from every other species. Where we are right now is the culmination of us being in that exact environment that he proposes we should go back to. So my point is that even if we did go back there, we would ultimately construct, reconstruct, I guess, in his scenario, something I can't imagine too much different than what we worked and suffered to create currently. So I think he's throwing the baby out with the bathwater, in essence, is, is my argument there. Um, we certainly are adapted to hunt and uh, not type for eight hours a day or stand on our feet for eight hours a day, like he says. I agree with him, and I, I agree that uh, that's the malignant kind of portion of our society that should be changed, but should be changed from within, not without. And the idea of the existential suicide, going out in the wild, is that's what he suggests it would be. Well, Albert Camus says that the existential hero grapples with the absurdity. Let me shift. Of the universe and decides to take complete responsibility for his actions. The inability to find this reason or the meaning of one's life is what leads to existential angst. So our question is what is the meaning we're looking for? What is that meaning that would prevent existential angst? Suicide is an extreme form of existential angst, where the man rejects the freedom begotten by the act of the being, of being responsible for his actions, and gives in to the inherent meaninglessness of the world. And uh, to support that, I would say that, again, I, I know I don't have the whole picture. I'm not in his head. I'm not going to profess to portray an accurate example of what he would probably say if, if me and him were having a in-person dialogue. But he did say in the video, um, video games, well, any, any form of entertainment, but clearly he plays a lot of video games or used to at least, is meaningless and just a you know, form of opiate, a form of drug, uh, coma-inducing drug, you know, the opiate of the masses to create the analogy, uh, the analog of religion, as said by Marx. And so he believes that essentially he's not deriving any meaning from a lot of what he does, because I assume he plays video games, yet he still does it doesn't get meaning from it, obviously doesn't get meaning from any past work he did. I think he's getting the most meaning out of making these videos, which would not be able to occur. He would not be able to connect with half a million people on a regular basis if we didn't have technology. And he was literally um, talking about not allowing ourselves any technology, whether it's a gun or even something as primitive as a fishing pole. 
I mean, I guess he would uh, he would try to create, you know, tool up an actual fishing pole at some point. And perhaps he would find the most meaning in creating it himself rather than allowing any remnant of the civilization that he is denying should exist to, uh, to exist in his new paradigm. I heard something interesting Jordan Peterson said in an interview with Ben Shapiro and uh, Dave Rubin the other day. This is me paraphrasing it, but he said, meaning is where you occupy the optimal position in the dynamic space of existence. So, and I actually saw ER do this, do this uh, talking about alignment, like when you're in nature, you feel like your being is aligned. I think all your concerns and desires are um, in sync and they're simultaneously being satisfied on all levels of your being and your and your uh, concern mm, things that are well, things that matter to you I guess things that give you meaning and I think there's a lot of overlap and I'm, I'm really curious if he ever mentions Jordan Peterson in his videos because he has actually made a, a couple of videos about Carl Jung and obviously Jordan Peterson is primarily influenced by Jung although he's well versed in a lot of other thinkers and psychologists and scientists philosophers but Carl Jung is who he most often attributes quotes and ideas to of his and he says meaning is essentially where it, it it's an instinct it's uh, he calls it the instinct of meaning and i think that's such a profound concept that it's, it's almost like um we talk about fear and you know emotions being instinctive and you can get into the the layers of the brain where we have the most primordial areas of the brain that we really can't control as easily as the upper layers of consciousness that we have um there are the most rational are on the outside the least rational most instinctive are in the core of our brain stem in our small brain there our reptilian brain and he thinks that meaning is an instinct and it's possibly the instinct the most important instinct that oh man i wrote it down too but i, I forgot where i wrote it but um he discussed meaning being the instinct that possibly allows us to make decisions it's like something like meaning is the evolved instinct to be able to accurately produce what we want in the future and uh, allow us to project ourselves in the right direction in the most meaningful direction in the future that will give us the most satisfaction and happiness and, and pride and in, in in what we've done so when something is meaningful to us, when we're in an interaction that's meaningful, he's Peterson's saying that that sense of meaning is actually an instinct that is manifesting itself, um, and we can't articulate it rationally most of the time. But what that's doing evolutionarily is telling us that what we're currently doing that's giving us meaning is the correct way that will lead us to our most optimal future position in the world. And Jesus, I'm not, I'm butchering that so terribly, but the way he said it, you know, clearly he's been thinking about it for 40 years, something like that. And so he, it just meant so much to me hearing that, uh, ironic, not ironically, but meaningfully. And so, um, 
I think what ER is essentially, to boil down his argument, if, if I were asked to, I would say that he's searching for meaning. I would say that he wants this radical change in his life because he doesn't have enough meaning in it, which I think might have been the case if he wasn't making these videos, but I think, um, I would, if I had to guess, I would say that these videos, other than his family, because he clearly values his family quite a bit, I would say that these videos give him the most meaning in his life. Um, so my, you know, this, this would be a good point to bring this. Let's uh, get into some sources. Sources here, and we have, uh, let's see if I could find this. So I didn't know anything about Hegel, um, Friedrich Hegel, I don't know, the philosopher Hegel, there's only one that matters apparently, I forget his name, it's probably right there. Hegel um, condemned as arbitrary any criticism of the past or present that was not accompanied by a, an appreciation of the significance of tradition. Um, he said another war might well spread the ideals of the French Revolution without endangering the future of civilization. And his interesting idea was that truth comes to light gradually, and uh, oh man, I mean, you can go into depth here, but um, doesn't believe that things are good because they succeed, but in fact that they succeed because they're good, and I think that ties into the idea of meaning, and um, our concept of good as it's evolved. Like, I think religion, although it seems like it's very stagnant and stale, it actually was kind of the, the glue. And ironically, if you try to dismiss religion, it'd be hard if you really gave it its due because I think, I don't think there's any tribe out there that doesn't have religion whether it's in the Amazon or modern day or if it's 3,000, 10,000 years ago. And it's hard, it's really hard to dismiss the fact that if religion is present in every existing unit of, uh, or group, I guess you could say, human, group of humans in the world, then wouldn't you have to say that religion There's some correlation between the existence of a group's religion and their ability to successfully recreate and uh, further their particular society. I, I, I think it's a pretty good argument. Um, in other words, the groups that didn't have religion were uh, Darwinistically, evolutionarily did not succeed. Um, only the ones that did were able to perhaps find enough meaning in life, or perhaps it was the 
the cultural cohesion that religion offered that allowed it to maintain stability and uh, perpetuate w truths that otherwise might not have been able to be taken seriously enough. You know, truths like sacrifice and um, and and the subservience of the king to the idea of a king. So, um, yeah, that side of the argument, I, I, I feel like I, if I didn't flesh it out good enough, at least I've spent enough time on it. Um, I don't I feel like I'm beating a dead horse again, but I think I really wanted to see this part of here. It was that there's an ultimate purpose, and that's freedom. And this furnishes a standard of judgment. Freedom is the ultimate purpose, and that's the part I really agree with ER on, is that he, uh, he ultimately... I'm going on for a while. He just wants us to be free as individuals, but... My argument against that is that yeah, we're very much so we're slaves. You can you can you can make that argument quite easily, you know. Well, especially in the third world countries, you don't have many degrees of freedom to work your way up the hierarchy. But think in order to create the situation where we were no longer slaves that would require the cult that would be the culmination of a significant or majority of individuals within that society to shoulder the burden of making them making the best out of their own lives and making the most out of their own abilities and talents and skills such that the unit of civilization is actually nothing but the product of a large number of individuals within it that make it up and i think that's all it really is society is the unit of society only matters in so much as it's it is the emergent unit created by the group, um, created by the cooperation of a series of individuals within it. So in other words, it, the individuals make up the society. They are the fundamental unit and the unit of society and civilization in general is dependent on the individual. That's what I think is most profound about Peterson's argument here. And that's why his study of communism led him to believe that the unit is the individual. Um, the individual is the unit that is most, should most be prioritized over the group. That's why he's against communism, fascism, and group identity politics. I think that's, in a, in a nutshell... Uh, well, I think that explains his um, his view in a nutshell. It doesn't support it, but it explains, and um, at least posits his uh, establishes his position at least. So I want to. Uh, I want to elaborate on that for a second because he says all that matters from a Darwinian perspective is permanence. And this is, uh, yeah, this is in the first first chapter, first first rule, which is stand up straight with your shoulders back, which is. Something I haven't done this whole episode. Um, when you're trying to figure out what's real and truth, 
after, I don't know if you guys have listened, but he had a, like a two or three hour episode dialogue with Sam Harris about the nature, the fundamental nature of truth. What is truth? Truth is, in Sam's idea, it's objective reality entirely severed from any perspectives that would come from a subjective being. He believes in objective, the objective existence of matter, energy, and the laws that govern them. That's it. Peterson is a lot more open to a dynamic view of truth. At least he's open to the idea that we don't understand truth enough to make a definite statement about what it is um, or even what box we might be able to put it in currently what he believes is that uh, he only knows what's real so we won't talk about truth but we'll talk about reality and he knows that from evolutionary biology Archaeology, it is what is real is what has existed. What is the common thread, essentially? He looks at all of what we're able to evolutionarily study, and he recognizes the dominance hierarchy, however, social. Oh, he recognizes it as the dominance hierarchy, and he says. This hierarchy, however social or cultural it might appear to be, has been around for about half a billion years. Half a billion years. It's permanent. It's real. And it's not capitalism, not communism, but... Um, it's not even a human creation in the most profound sense. And yeah, I'm going to throw this one in just... Uh, just for you, it is instead a near eternal aspect of the environment, and much of what is blamed on these more ephemeral manifestations is a consequence of its unchanging existence. We've lived in dominance hierarchies for a long, long time. We were struggling for position before we had skin, hands, lungs, or bones. There is little more natural than that. No, 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 he says, there's little more natural than culture. Dominance hierarchies are older than trees. And that's where he's known for his lobster. For being affiliated with teaching about the lobster. The part of our brain that keeps track of our position in the dominance hierarchy is therefore exceptionally ancient and fundamental. He goes on to say that uh, that's why it affects every aspect of our being. When we're defeated, that's why we act very much like lobsters who have lost a fight. Our posture drops, we face the ground. We don't do anything to improve, we get chronically depressed. So he's saying the basic neurochemistry is the same. What does he say? Yeah, so we have a uh, Consider serotonin, the chemical that governs posture and escapes in the lobster, and escape in the lobster. Low-ranking lobsters produce comparatively low levels of serotonin. This is also true of low-ranking ranking human beings. It means, it means decreased 
confidence. Low serotonin means more response to stress and a costier, costlier physical preparedness for emergency. So what he's saying is that um, Uh, again, a, a fundamental instinct that we have is our ability to recognize where we are on the dominance hierarchy. And he says that regulates our mood and everything about us, our being. It's, it's ingrained. It's a fundamental part of our psyche. And when we know we're at the bottom, we're much more we're aware of our susceptibility to... Um, really abuse in, in any form of uh, negative interaction. Um, we're much more aware of our vulnerabilities. When we're at the top, we have a lot more serotonin flowing through our brains and we're much more, we're able to much, we're able to take a hit, we're able to take a loss, as they say, take an L, uh, with much less risk, you know, because you're already at the top there's a long way down before you hit the bottom so there's plenty of room to play there and there's plenty of room to work your way up and even if you take a loss and you're near the top you're still going to be better you're going to be in your mind and uh, as long as you're in tune enough with reality in everybody else's mind then you're going to still be well ahead of the curve and uh, therefore you don't really have any reason to um feel that that anxiety of, of losing nearly as much as someone who has not worked their way up to the top. So, it goes on, let me just, uh, let's see if I can find this, here we go. This is, this is why I like having a physical copy of the book. So I can underline, because I underline the shit out of my books. I hate, uh, maybe I should just one day meet him up and get his signature, because this, this book is, without a doubt, it's going to go down as uh, one of the great books of the 21st century, I feel. So, anyways... So he's talking about once you acknowledge the fact that the importance of recognizing that our neuro neurochemistry is controlled from these really ancient um, barometers, I guess, of uh, these really ancient instruments in our brain that, that are constantly, constantly aware of our place on the hierarchy within our society. Uh, that's when the awakening occurs. And he says, when once naive people recognize in themselves the seeds of evil and monstrosity, they see themselves as dangerous, or at least potentially, and their fear decreases. They develop more self-respect and I just skipped a bunch of pages, but he's talking about once you recognize the ability, once you recognize that we derive meaning from where we perceive our place on the dominance hierarchy, and that um, a low place on the dominance hierarchy often comes from being undisciplined, and lacking responsibility, taking responsibility for things. All things I can relate to, and I, and I feel it. Maybe, you know, could very much be, uh, what's the word? Some, some form of biasness or whatever. And I'm just projecting myself onto what I'm learning. Could very well be that. But at the same time, it's hard to deny the reality of everything he says. I mean, there is clearly a hierarchy. Clearly feel bad. When we're down, clearly feel better when we're up. Um, 
discipline responsibility for your actions, sacrifice for your future, um, not being aware that every little decision you make adds up to a summation of your emergent identity and therefore every time you fuck up every time you make a irresponsible or cowardly decision that just makes you a little bit smaller makes your psyche feel a little bit weaker all those things and conversely every time you make a decision that you're proud of that aligns your being in uh, the way you feel in the hierarchy the way you feel about what what benefits you're incurring um, you're able to give to those that you care about to the ideas that you care about such as your yourself your family your loved ones your friends and extrapolating out further and further into a broader scope your uh, your community your city your 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 state your government your your nation ultimately if we're wise enough our species then ultimately all life and then ultimately being itself maybe and uh yeah it has a rippling transformative effect and he's saying the way to overcome the fear and the the, the grossly apparent anxiety of, of taking on the burden of for responsibility for your own life and your position in the hierarchy that's that fear can be superseded by a knowledge of reality that whether you're at the top or the bottom of the hierarchy you have the capacity as a human to know how a human that knows how how you can be hurt therefore you can extrapolate because we are thinking the thinking species after all can easily extrapolate how to make other people suffer as well because we know what makes us suffer so wherever you occupy your position in the hierarchy you have that capacity for evil it's within you to be a monster um, whether it's a cowardly weak resentful bitter monster or a powerful um, capable, competent monster. Either way, you you have that capacity within you. And uh, his argument, very, very distilled down, and well, maybe not distilled, but very simplified, is that um, it's much better, and you can rationally write it out, to run away from the cowardly aspect and move towards the noble, competent aspect of being a monster, and that the ideal that we should all strive for is to be a civilized monster. We should have the capacity and we should know furthermore that we have the capacity to do do evil. Not, not because it's some um, delusion of, of you know, positive delusions I think Peterson always references being uh, ridiculous. Because you don't you can't found confidence. You can't you can't have the fun, the foundation of your confidence be riding on top of a shaky delusion that oh, everything's good. You know, you have to be solid. I want to rest on a solid foundation that you actually know your capacity for evil is within you. You know, whether it's latent, whether it's buried. Or whether you are consciously aware of it, it's there. So why not be consciously aware of it and be confident that you know you're capable of evil. And it's not just going to come to you. He, he dismisses in every aspect the ability to just have it manifest. It, it, it comes through action. And his whole point is, to take action and take responsibility as an individual in our society and then the culmination of all those individuals will in fact 
produce a civilization that we want to live in that we are actually not inclined to call cancer. So. Yeah, once you develop that, I think a pretty cool, positive message from it to me was you develop more self-respect and perhaps you begin to resist oppression. So, that's cool. Um, all right. I think I tackled everything that I wanted to in the video, surprisingly. I agree uh, with ER that we are well more beyond advanced technologically relative to our, uh, as he said, our behavior. So behaviorally or morally, I would say, it's an analog to that, is that... Um, The behavior, the morals that have informed our behaviors for years have got us through evolutionarily the last hundred thousand years, maybe quarter million years, who knows, who knows how old the, the myths and stories of religion that religion's based off of uh, are, really, how long we've been telling similar stories about heroes and about inspiring individuals that we could try to emulate and that in fact doing so helps the individual and thereby the group that that individual belongs to um, improve their lot in life and position technologically and hierarchically relative to other groups so um, it's an evolutionarily very adaptively beneficial existent cultural phenomenon meme if you will uh, religion is but nonetheless you gotta think it's like we've been using flint tools for a quarter million years we wouldn't really if we had we wouldn't be in the we wouldn't have uh, you know gotten past agriculture and uh, we definitely wouldn't have been able to build the pyramids, let alone the Large Hadron Collider. So, I think there's a very important and very sincere case to be made, and very, um, very practical, very relevant, very, well, very important for, our, for the future of humanity to be made, that we need to somehow advance everybody's concept beyond our ancient morals created by the laws that we've been following for hundreds of thousands of years and uh, in its more contemporary form for at least 2,000 or, at, you know, to be given its due maybe only 500 years. So maybe it has shifted a little bit, but it's far, far behind where it should be to be able to regulate nuclear weapons that could destroy literally um, scorched earth literally be able to uh, inform the morals behind our ability to scorch the entire earth destroy the biosphere of an entire planet our morals are not up to date I agree with them 100% on that and I, th I think that's I think that's his position, relatively. So... Without God, I, 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 the more I listen to JBP, the more I'm inclined to believe that the idea of God, aside from the proclamation that he as an entity exist or not 
is so, so important to us that we shouldn't dismiss it. And I think ER sees that. He, he recognizes that there, uh, there, there may be a God because of the Fermi paradox, basically, he references. He even mentions that, um, which is explained. Uh, what it, well, he, he mentions that it's very improbable and there might be credit to the idea of a god, uh, some sort of creation, creator, um, that explains the fact that we have discovered literally trillions of stars um, among just our local group of galaxies alone, yet we have no evidence whatsoever of intelligent civilization. And he thinks that's ridiculous. Uh, he thinks that's drastically improbable. And I'm in, I'm in complete agreement with him on that. So, um, I think the Fermi Paradox is uh, something that tries to uh, encapsulate that idea in a phrase, uh, you know, to organize it in our minds that um, we, we should definitely see it's very very improbable that we're the only ones in this galaxy we're the only planet that uh, life is formed on intelligent life at least but going back to the idea of God Nietzsche is important in that realm he says that evolutionarily we evolved with the idea of God so whether we think Technology has disproved that because God filled all these. Man, I'm getting really hungry. Because, because God, um, God was the blanket statement answer to all our lack of knowledge and um, a lot of those areas that were attributed to God prior to 300 years ago 500 years ago are now being explained very logically and, and um, practically scientifically he said Nietzsche believes that that's a that's a fallacy to, again, throw the baby out with the bathwater. Just because we're able to explain some phenomena does not necessarily mean that we can extrapolate that and explain all phenomena eventually, because we haven't yet. And um, some things such as consciousness are literally inexplicable right now and are, in fact, so so complex and we have so little understanding of how they work that it's although we can leave room for the possibility that uh, that there is no God we'd be unwise and haughty and mendacious as Nietzsche likes to say a lot that to assume that we already know enough to be able to eventually figure it all out. So I think it's just wise not to put the uh, cart before the horse, as they say, and uh, just assume that based on our, our scientific capabilities, our technological advancements, we've essentially discovered all there is to know such as uh, a lot of people made in the 1800s talking about the cosmos, thinking that our galaxy was the universe, when in fact, no, it was uh, really incomprehensibly not such a small part of the universe that uh, we actually even know about today. So, um... Yeah, 
so I think the the idea of nihilism can be refuted just based on the fact that there is meaning that that we actually feel if you didn't feel meaning then why would you care about living with other people and dating why would you give a shit about your family um, Jordan Peterson's argument that suffering is the one thing you can't deny and the absence of suffering is good um, therefore and meaning is created instinctively based on relationships and experience in the world um, mostly pertaining to developing and, uh, and cultivating skills that, uh, that, that we can use to benefit our the ones we care about and uh, therefore society by walking the line between order and chaos and constantly pushing our boundaries and limits and expanding our ab abilities uh, he thinks that that is enough evidence for meaning that uh, that it's a, you know obviously it's a very simple simplified argument but he thinks that's enough to refute the concept of nihilism where nothing has any meaning because the universe is going to just uh, if we extrapolate our knowledge currently it's just going to end in the heat death of uh of all the matter and energy in the cosmos in 500 trillion years or something like that. So, Alright, I, I think I covered everything I wanted to here, so other than, I, I think I pretty much, well I wanted to maybe mention that um, the medical issues alone regarding going back to a primitive lifestyle would preclude that from happening ever. I, I, I don't know what his technical, specific argument against that would be, but I don't really see a way out of that. I mean, do we destroy all of civilization except for hospitals and, and the institutions that allow us to create doctors, like universities? Um, I, I, I don't see how that's possible, so ER, if you're listening, I hope... There's no way in hell you actually got to the end of this video, even if you did click on it. So, either way, I hope some of this gets to you and uh, we can have a dialogue about this because I think you're an intelligent, inspiring, creative, um, courageous dude. And uh, I think you have a lot to offer, not just the ASMR community, but um, I think you have a lot of really good ideas and... Uh, I just wanted to try to just have a little fun and, and uh, maybe open a dialogue with you about these interesting ideas that you're putting forth. So, I'm going to leave it there, guys, and uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Subscribe, like, those comments really do keep this channel going. Um, if you really think you're getting something out of it, of course, you have the option uh, to donate Bitcoin. Um, I'll have to set up an Ethereum account, apparently. Bitcoin's uh, not the only way people like donating cryptocurrencies. And, um, yeah, uh, I in no way, you know, um, want to try to push that on people. It, it's just very, very inspiring, very encouraging for me to see that. If you throw a buck or two my way, that's so cool. So very cool. And, um, I enjoy doing this, so I hope to increase my ability to put out more and more quality content and uh, I only do that with the help of you guys and um, it just means a lot so if you enjoyed this let me know what you think um, I'm sure I'm going to get plenty of insightful um, I hope critical comments below I'm going to try to, uh, I'll link 
the Yars video. I'm trying to think of anything else I want to say. Other than, yeah, I want to encourage you guys to give me feedback. This was feedback to ER. So, it's going to be an open letter to him. And I invite you guys to critique my arguments. Um, all I ask is that you do it in a civilized manner. But tell me if you see gaping holes in my logic or even ideas you don't think are correctly founded, then uh, please let me know, honestly. I encourage you for sure to uh, absolutely um, voice your opinion. And I read every comment, even if I don't get to it for a few days. So uh, just let you know, you are being heard and read. And I uh, hope you guys enjoyed it. Sleep well.